All right, I've got 10 fast theories that might completely change the way you rewatch Red Dwarf in the future. Let's dive in. Number one, there's a conspiracy because Peterson killed the crew. What's this? Olaf Peterson is shown to be a catering officer aboard Red Dwarf and a complete drunk. Yet, in the very first episode, The End, when Lister is revived and he's walking around the ship and we see the various piles of ashes, Holly tells us that one of them is Olaf Peterson. In the drive room? A catering officer? What on earth is he doing there? That is catering officer Olaf Peterson. <laughs> and why on earth was he not in Rimmer's death video? Could it be that there's some strange conspiracy going on with Olaf Peterson? He should not have been in the drive room, but he was. He should have been in Rimmer's death video, but he wasn't. Is there something going on here? Was he deleted from footage? Was there some cover-up going on? I don't know! But it's a fun little theory to make you think next time you watch it. Second quick thought, all of series eight was in artificial reality? Now I know you could apply this idea to basically any part of Red Dwarf. You could say that as soon as they got the Better Than Life headsets in series two, everything that follows could still be in the Better Than Life dream. Okay, I get that idea, but I'm picking on series eight in particular for these three reasons. Firstly, the closing shot from series seven shows the original style of Red Dwarf, the sort of shorter, fatter style of Red Dwarf ship. But as soon as we get to series eight and we see the ships again, it's the long extended modernized ship, but it's supposed to be the same moment in time. So what's going on? How has it suddenly changed? Maybe they're in artificial reality and something's shifted in the artificial reality dream. Second point is when they're on the ship, it's actually mentioned about being in artificial reality. It's a big plot point in the first few episodes of series eight. And it even establishes the idea of having dreams within dreams, kind of Inception style. So it's like the show is telling us about artificial reality and about dreams, which could be a big hint that they're still in one. And thirdly, and this is the most convincing one for me, all of the crew apparently get off of Red Dwarf and escape in Starbucks and Blue Midgets. So all of the crew escape at the end of series eight. But after series eight, we never get a mention of them. But not just that we don't get a mention of them, we still get Lister referred to as the last human or the last human male and needing to continue on the human race. But you're the last human being alive with no life, no family, no future, no prospect. The future of the human race is entirely in your, in your well. Why would you put that pressure on him? Why would you still refer to him as like humanity's last chance? if there's thousands of other crew members just out there in space somewhere still doing fine and there's men and women and they can have children just fine. Why would you still put that pressure on Lister unless series eight never really happened and it was all an artificial reality dream? Just a thought. So theory number three, what if Todd Hunter didn't say shit? Okay, let me explain quickly. Throughout the different series of the show, the crew count has changed from 169 early on to 1,169 later. And then in the books, it's 11,169. So we've got different crew counts, usually just getting bigger and bigger. But one of the things we base the early low crew count of 169 on is Todd Hunter's words. In the very first episode, in the very first scene, in fact, he says there are 169 people on board this ship. But what if Todd Hunter had just mispronounced and actually meant there are 169 people on board this shift. There are 169 people on board this ship. You, Rimmer, are over one man. Why can't you two get on? Board this ship, you board this ship, you board this ship, you board this ship. That would actually cast things in a completely different light. It would just mean that Z Shift with uh, Rimmer, Lister and others had 169 people in it, but the total crew count could be a completely different number. It's an interesting thought. Perhaps they were on shore leave and not actually on the ship itself, or he just meant like, those people don't count, you're not gonna run into them, they're elsewhere on the ship, re relaxing or whatever. What if he'd said shift instead of ship? Okay, number four. Have you ever seen those x-rays that are just inside the medical room when the future echo of Lister comes out holding the babies? Have you ever seen those x-rays and wondered, Whose x-rays are those? No, no, you haven't, have you? It's just me that would notice that. Sad Dan over here. Anyhow, I think there's a good possibility that they're actually Lister's own x-rays, but not from a future echo, from three million years earlier. 
you might just assume that the x-rays are part of the future echo and are showing Lister's tummy to look for the babies inside, but it doesn't look like that to me. I don't see any little children in there. I think more likely they are indeed x-rays of Lister, but they're three million years old x-rays of Lister from back when the crew was still alive and Lister fell in the cargo bay. At the time your safety harness snapped and you fell into the cargo bay. <laughs> Rocking my spine in three places. You laughed. I spent six weeks interaction. Sure, there's a remote possibility that they might be George McIntyre's x-rays. Perhaps the crew wanted to find out why it was he died. But I think more likely they're Lister's x-rays. I think that's kind of a cool little detail. Okay, quick idea number five. Why did Rimmer's mind make him guilty when he went to Justice World, but it made him innocent before the Inquisitor? Hmm, his own mind himself made him guilty in one and kind of innocent and a worthwhile person in the other. Could it be that Crichton did such a good job explaining how, because he's such a halfwit, Rimmer isn't really responsible for the radiation leak? Could it be that Rimmer actually believed him actually believed what Crichton was saying. So five episodes later, his mind has accepted it so much that he sees himself as innocent and a justified, worthwhile person. So was it because of Crichton's lawyer-like defense that Rimmer saw himself as justified? Number six, Rimmer is so superhuman as a hard light hologram that the diamond light version of Rimmer is almost pointless. He's already pretty much superhuman. He can take basically unlimited damage without dying. He can be beaten over the head for long periods of time without losing consciousness. He can turn himself into soft light and pass through walls. And he's already shown himself to be more or less immortal, having lived already over 600 years, thanks to his little stop off on Rimmerworld. He's already pretty superhuman. If it wasn't for his innate cowardice, he could do amazing things, like Ace Rimmer does, if he would just sort of accept the fact that he's already pretty superhuman. I mean, Ace Rimmer kind of proved that the only thing that could really stop him even falling out of a plane didn't do it, was a bullet and some really lucky shot that managed to hit his light bee. But as long as you can protect that light bee, he's pretty much superhuman. So does it make diamond light almost unnecessary? Okay, number seven. Did the 171-year-old future echo of Lister and the future echo of Bexley not just cross a time barrier, did those future echoes cross a reality barrier as well? Does light speed mean you cross realities a little bit? Because it sort of seems like we're not on a path for either of those things to actually come true. I suppose they still could. I suppose that's not impossible, but it seems like maybe they crossed realities and we're seeing different versions of Lister's future. Could future echoes cross the reality barrier? Number eight, has the Inquisitor got droid rot? Has his circuits gone bandit after all those years of learn in deep space? It's an interesting question and one that I think needs answering. When you think about it, his whole premise of getting people to judge their own lives and you know yourself, you're judged by yourself, it's the worst system I've ever heard of in my life because you're judged by yourself at your current age, at your current point in life. I could just be having a bad week and think, oh, you're not worthy. I could just be having a bad week. I can't judge my own life until I get to, perhaps until I get to the very end of my life, you know, when I'm 80 odd years old, maybe I can look back on life and judge it as worthy. But at this current point now, I could just be having a bad time. And in fact, you could still be 80 years old and misjudge your life. A murderer could look back on their life and if they felt that that murder was justified, they'd see themselves as being a worthy, justified person. You're the worst person to judge your own life. Case in point, Rimmer judged himself as worthy. <sighs> Number nine, was Rimmer perfectly justified in trying to be machine president in Macocrity? Okay, we all know that Rimmer would be a terrible machine president, but was he perfectly justified in trying to be? Well, when you think about it, he's a machine. It's not really mentioned in the episode, but he's a machine just as much as Crichton is. In fact, Crichton has some organic parts in his brain. We know that from the episode DNA, whereas Rimmer is totally digital now. 
it's a computer doing all the thinking for him. Which is something that got mentioned by the cat of all people in the promised land. You don't decide what you do. The computer in your life be does all your thinking for you. So it's an interesting thought. Actually, Rimmer was just as justified in trying to be machine president as Crichton was because he's just as much a machine. And number 10 is Lister, a secret robotics genius. I think I might have mentioned this once before, but he seems to show an absolutely amazing set of skills with robotics. He fixed his robot goldfish in seconds with just kind of prodding around inside. Maybe not the best example, but he built up the Marilyn Monroe droid. He rebuilt Crichton after he got smashed up with the space bike. He cut Crichton in half and put him back together. He kind of poked and prodded around inside of Crichton's mind. Okay, he blew a load of minds up, but it seems like that wasn't his fault because of the Nega Drive. And just generally, he seems very handy with fixing things and electronics around Red Dwarf and whatnot. He just seems generally quite a gifted guy especially with robotics. Or to quote Captain Hollister, quite bright. Which brings me on to another thought. Is he not just a secret robotics genius? Could he really be secretly related to Joseph Lister? The bouncer in Twentica asked if he was related to Joseph Lister. I wonder if secretly, back in Lister's timeline, maybe he could be. I mean, he doesn't know who his parents were. Okay, we find out later it's his, he's his own father, but still there must be some genetic source somewhere. Maybe one of the sources of his genetics was Joseph Lister, and that's why he's so gifted. Where the laziness comes from, that's a whole other story. Well, there you go, fellow dwarfers. Ten theories in one video. I hope you enjoyed that. If you've got any of these that you think are kind of worth me investigating further and maybe making a full video on, let me know. Theory 1, Theory 2, Theory 10. Let me know in the comments down below. If you're not subscribed, I'd love to invite you to do so. There's loads of you guys now. It's it's mad. And if you want to see more theories like this and have some fun, click this video up here. If you don't, I'm going to send the Inquisitor after you and make you explain yourself. Go on. Click it.